Well, here we are with the third part of our great Nehemiah story. And uh, it began, as if you remember, that uh, Jerusalem, as it records in Nehemiah 1.3, um, the remnant there in the province who'd survived the exile are in great trouble and shame. The walls are broken down. The gates are destroyed with fire. And do you remember when they, uh, Nehemiah heard this news, uh, then his heart was touched by it. The people were in distress. The people were defenceless. And because of this, they were in derision by uh, their enemies. But somebody cared. So the first part of Nehemiah is all about the journey of this one man. And there's no doubt in my mind that God is looking for people whose hearts will be touched. Uh, like Nehemiah, like Moses, like David, all through the Bible, the Holy Spirit concentrates on individuals whose hearts will be touched. And then how they somehow connected with the people so the work in their generation could be done. Somebody cared. And that person was Nehemiah. If you remember, last week we talked in chapter 2 about how he was passionate. His heart was touched. He was prayerful. He prayed about everything. And he prayed a great deal about this. Day and night, the Bible says. He was practical. He got all the wood, all the timber. He got letters from Artaxerxes before he left on this great journey to Jerusalem. He was patient too. He waited for God's timing. He was God's man for this time. Interestingly enough, he just had one thing that he wanted to achieve. He wanted to build those walls. We're going to look today at what that one thing maybe is for us, what that one thing is for you that you can give your life to. The fifth point about Nehemiah was that he was productive. And we're going to begin uh, this uh, today by looking at that productivity in his life. At the end of chapter 2 and verse, verses 17 and 18, we, uh, we, talk, we come across a key moment, the absolutely key moment in this story, when somehow that vision that was burning in the heart of Nehemiah was transmitted to the people. Because one thing he knew for sure was that he, as an individual, could not build all those walls. No way. But together, they could. And so we see that uh, if we look at a, a, a map of those uh, incredible walls, it was one project. And that project was to, to regain the defence around Jerusalem. There were 39 sections that had to be built, walls and gates. And there were 39 people or groups of people who worked on those sections. And this speaks about the grand project that God has called us to. And how as individuals we can do our jobs. And I'd like you this morning to think about how you can do your job. What is my part in this project? Indeed, what is God's project on earth today? I think it's very simple actually. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus says these incredible words, I will build my church. And then, interestingly, he adds, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so this church that Jesus is building has got defences. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we are not building his church. He is building his church. And we are co-workers with him in this project. Father, this morning I pray that as we look at this project, that you will speak to each one of our hearts and show us somehow what we might do as co-workers with you in this incredible project. Amen. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. That's talking about Jesus. How after the resurrection, he took uh, captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. And then actually it talks about five kinds of people that he gave to the church. Apostles, 
prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. But then it explains, uh, crucially, in verse 15 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint. The picture here is of a body and it's held together by the joints. How are your joints? I don't mean your arthritic joints. I mean your relationships where a person meets with people. Our relationships, keeping things sweet, working for peace is so important to the working of the body. With which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Do you know what you're doing? Do I know what I'm doing? Am I working properly? Because it says that this makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love so the body that's each one of us we are building the walls of this project it's building the church the evangelists are taking people from the world and bringing them into the body of christ and the body grows and improves and grows in faith and love and more and more people are added to it until it reaches the fullness of christ when we shall be like him one day but until that time god wants to use us to build his church and then there are some incredible people building those 39 parts of the wall and i want to just uh, take a few of these people as illustrations of how we can serve god in the church Verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, it says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. What an example of leadership. It starts with the top dog. It starts with the top man. It starts with the high priest. And you'd think that he should be in the holy place or the holiest of all, offering incense. But here he is, sleeves rolled up ready to put down his priorities and make God's project his priority. It says they built the sheep gate. It was the sheep gate because it was familiar to them. They brought the sheep for sacrifice through the sheep gate. And then it says and they consecrated the work because that's what priests did. Nobody else consecrated them. It was unique. Everything here was together but unique. And then it talks about another person. And after him, Merimoth. Now, interestingly enough, this is a bit further on, but it shows that as Eliashib, the high priest, was giving himself to this project, God was looking after his back. It says that Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakos, re repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest, to the end of the house of Eliashib. So while he was working on one part, somebody was looking after the wall around his house. You see, we cannot lose by doing God's work. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. Give and it shall be given unto you. And then going back to verse 2, it says, And next to him the men of Jericho built. This is interesting. You see, Jericho was a long way from Jerusalem. There were other people like the men of Gibeon from another city far away from Jerusalem. And yet they were prepared to drop their parochial thing because God was doing something here and they wanted to muck in and join it. And then next to them, Zachor, the son of Imri built. What's it, what, what is significant about this? Well, this is one man building one part of the wall. I don't know whether it was a big part or a small part or whether he was a big man and able to do a lot of work, but it was just one person doing it. At different times of our life, there will be times when we are alone. I know I felt that aloneness sometimes at school, at university, I felt aloneness. Um, God led me to be married, which has been a happy arrangement. But you know, one day it could be that I won't be married to Joe any longer and she won't be married to me because one of us will have passed into glory. I think of my mother-in-law. She spent most of the end of her life unmarried. She was actually a widow for longer than she was married. And so we mustn't think that being in a relationship is everything. Because while we are alone, God wants to use our aloneness. In fact, Paul said, I envy those that are alone. They can be 
uh, without distraction in the work of God. So whether we are together or whether we are alone, we have a work to do. And we shouldn't let these life circumstances limit us in God's work. And then it says in verse um, two, uh, sorry, that verse five are the bad boys, the good boys and the bad boys. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. Good old Tekoites. But then it says, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. What a pity. Somebody once said, if you're too big to be led, you are too little to lead. And that was true in this case. In fact, the only benefit they derived from this was that for, for generation after generation, the nobles of Tekoa would be remembered as the guys who were too big to muck in with everybody else. But it didn't stop the guys. And I think the lesson here is that we mustn't let our, let our leadership hinder us. Maybe we think, oh, I wish the leaders did this. I wish the leaders did this, that. I wish we did this at New Life. Um, uh, I wish that the leaders would let me or appoint me to do this. Do you know there's a big world out there? And there's a, a, a lot of people to be loved. There's a big church that can be loved by anybody. And there's a big God who can be loved by us all. So there's lots for us to do. And we mustn't be hindered by maybe what we feel are, are, are poor decisions of the leaders or being hindered uh, in our ministry uh, by leaders. We need to just get on with God's work and he will find things for us to do. And then it says uh, in verse 11, next to him, Shalom. Why is Shalom in there? not in there just for himself interestingly enough this man Shalom was ruler of half the district of Jerusalem he he led a big area of Jerusalem and yet he could roll up his sleeves Jesus said if anyone wants to be be a leader they must first serve that's the way it is in the kingdom of God and then there are his daughters it says uh, he was the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem and he and his daughters worked on it. Again, this gender isn't there. Maybe we feel there's not enough room in the church at large for, for women in the church. But God has always found things to do for those who are willing to serve him. He will make a way. And so these uh, wonderful daughters, they got on. Maybe they weren't the best equipped to, 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 to build this wall. Maybe they were. We don't know. But we do know they were willing. You see, God is looking more for availability than ability. And then in verse 31, it says, After him, Malkija, one of the goldsmiths. Now, there are three of these guys called Malkija in this section of Nehemiah. And the first one was one of the goldsmiths. And again, the point to make here is you don't have to be a, 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 a bricklayer to, to work on, on the wall. You don't have to be someone specially gifted to do God's work. These people here, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple. He wasn't a builder, he was a goldsmith. But God let him and his, uh, sir, uh, uh, and his colleagues build that wall together. And then the second Malkijah, it says this, he was ruler of the district of Beth Hakarem, and he repaired the dung gate. Oh dear, I wonder whether it was drawn by Lot, who was going to work at the dung gate. You know, God sometimes asks us to work in smelly, uh, unconven inconvenient situations, maybe with difficult people, maybe with problem people, maybe with people with addictions, in difficult circumstances. We can't choose to always work with our friends. God sometimes puts us with people that we wouldn't naturally get on with, but we need to rejoice like these men in just getting on with it. And then uh, the third Malkija is a guy called Malkija, the son of Harim. And it's interesting because he is mentioned in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 31 as a man who was rebuked by, by uh, Ezra. He was reproved because he had married a pagan wife. But thank God he sorted that out and he went on into the work. And we must never let our pasts 
stop us from doing God's work. David managed to carry on after the Bathsheba incident, after the census that he shouldn't have carried on. He still went on with God and God continued to use him. The blood of Jesus uh, cleanses us from every sin and releases us to do the work of God in the present. If you're burdened by guilt or a sense of inferiority or God can never use me again, we need to dispense with that idea. If we are willing and we have confessed our sins and we, if we are willing to do whatever God wants, he will use our lives. And then finally, I want to mention some people that uh, Jan actually mentioned in the prayer meeting on Tuesday. And she noticed in this little passage that they started to work. Here it says, um, next to them, uh, Jediah, the son of Harumath, repaired opposite his house. And I think there are five people here who repaired opposite their house. Where do we start? Jan read this passage and she, she found opportunity. God gave her an opportunity to reach out to her neighbour. And it was a blessing. Who are you near at work? Who is in your family? Who is your neighbour? There is opportunity to love them. So let's start with where we are, with our grand ambitions of where we might be. I'd like to finish with a verse from Acts, chapter 9, verse 6. And this is where Saul, who has certainly had a bad past, meets Jesus. And after an incredible encounter with the Lord, he says these words, What would you have me do? Six words. What do you want me to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing work that you are doing in our day. This is the age of the church. This is the time where Jew and Gentile can work together to do your work. This is the time when you are reaching the nations through your church, through the body of Christ. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being part of your church, being literally part of your body. Father, I pray that as we meditate upon this, you will think, who is my neighbour? Who is that person at work? Who is that person I'm studying with? Who can I love? Father, give me opportunities to build your church. Amen.